Hello, Facebook. <clears throat> Prof. Doug Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. All right, let's say a prayer and jump right in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for another chance to come before your presence. Thank you, Lord, for another chance to be used by you. Thank you, Lord, for a chance to be a part of your program. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, <coughs> excuse me, and your kindness. So, Lord, I surrender myself to your God. Breathe through me. Speak to me by the Holy Ghost and let what is said be what you want said to the honor and glory of your name and according to your divine purpose. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me give you a quick preamble before we jump into the live prophetic word. Now, Bishop T.D. Jakes said something this morning that was so powerful, so powerful, and it really, really blessed me. So I just want to share it briefly with you if you didn't see Bishop this morning. <clears throat> Bishop Jakes this morning said, it's not my job to fill the stadium. It's not my job to fill the church. He said, that's why I don't have any problem preaching in front of empty pews or rocks or grass or whatever. He said, that's not my job. He said, it's my job to say what God told me to say. And then he said, because when I stand before God, God is not going to ask me, did they like you? God is going to ask me, did you do what I told you to do? Did you say what I told you to say? And just, wow, that just blessed my heart. That just blessed my soul. <clears throat> Again, because he said that we're, we're too focused on the wrong things and we're too busy tripping on the wrong stuff. And that's one of the things that we trip on. But it's like, God is not going to ask you, do people like you? God is not going to ask you about your popularity. God's not going to ask you that. God's going to ask you, did you do what I told you to do? That's the thing. And I thought that was extremely powerful. So that helps me transition into what the prophetic word is for today. Prophetic word for today is found in Nehemiah. Okay? It's found in Nehemiah. Now we're going to focus on verse uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse Five. We're going to focus on Nehemiah 1 and 5, but I'm actually going to read the entire chapter. Uh, there's 10 verses, so I'm actually going to read that entire chapter, but the focus is going to be on verse 5. Okay, so I'm going to read verse 5 first, and then I'm going to read the entire chapter, and then we'll go into it. Nehemiah one, is in the Old Testament, by the way. Uh, Nehemiah is in the Old Testament, that's not the New Testament. Uh, Nehemiah 1 and 5, I'm reading out of the NIV. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. One more time. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, I'm going to read the entire chapter for you uh, to give you some context, because it's when you understand the background and the context of what Nehemiah is saying. If you don't know who Nehemiah is, long story short, he was called by God to rebuild the temple. He was called by God to help rebuild the temple and help rebuild Israel <clears throat> after they had gone into captivity because they had been disobedient to God for a very long time and everything about the nation had become torn down, uh, which is kind of reminiscent, kind of dovetails with what's going on in our country. When I say our country, I mean America and American culture today, because everything about doing what God has told us to do as a nation has been torn down. And that's why everything is in such a disarray and the country has been burning and fighting and a whole lot of things have been happening. Well, this is similar to what's been going on, what's going on in this uh, scripture text today with Nehemiah and the Israelites. So I'm going to read out of the NIV, all 10 verses of the, excuse me, 11 verses of the first chapter. Here goes. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, 
one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, this is Nehemiah talking, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Okay, so if you don't understand all what that meant, long story short is that Israel had gone into a period of rebellion against God and they'd stayed in it to the point where they were openly worshiping other gods and building altars and burning incense and doing a whole bunch of things that provoked the Lord to jealousy. So the Lord sent them into exile and what that means was he cast them out of Jerusalem. Okay, now remember during the days of Solomon, Solomon sinned against God, but because of Solomon's father David, God said he was gonna bring the judgment that Solomon deserved onto his son Rehoboam and that's when Israel got split into the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. Okay, Northern Kingdom Israel, Southern Kingdom Judah, the nation got split. That was judgment on Solomon that wasn't enacted until Rehoboam, okay? Then they ended up going into exile, meaning they got put out of their land. So after all the trouble that God went through to bring them into the promised land, they got kicked out <laughs> and they went into exile. They lost the holy city and they were no longer living in Jerusalem in the land that God had promised them and their forefathers, okay? And so they were in exile for quite some time. So then we pick it up here in Nehemiah where he was talking to his brother and <clears throat> Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. That means he served the king by you know, bringing him his drink. And sometimes the cupbearer would have to taste the drink to be sure it wasn't poison. So the cupbearer might have to lose his life to preserve the life of the king. So anyway, in verse three, um, he said, those who survived the exile, so in other words, some of the Israelites got kicked out of Jerusalem and they died, okay? And they died, okay? Now you ought to be able to see now why the Lord gave me this text and the Lord gave me this word because this dovetails perfectly with what's going on today in America, okay? He said, those who survived the exile, everybody didn't survive, everybody didn't make it, okay? So that's the first thing you're gonna have to wrap your mind around is that when a nation goes into sin, it's true on an individual level, when you do it, it's true when your family does it, but when a nation does it, you're going to begin to be displaced and lose your land. And everybody's not going to survive. People have been wondering why there's been so much death in America, because we sinned as a nation against God, that's why. And everybody's not gonna survive, okay? So as Nehemiah's talking with his brothers, he said, those who survived the exile and are back in the province. So some survived the exile and made it back to Jerusalem, but he said they are, they are in great trouble and disgrace. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been in a situation, maybe you've been in a situation, or maybe you've seen somebody in a situation, but, but definitely there are times in life where sometimes you have to drag yourself back to the place you were supposed to be. 
You walked away from God. You disobeyed God. You disobeyed the leading of the Lord according to the word and the Holy Spirit. And you just went off and did what you wanted to do in spite of what God was telling you. You might not survive, okay? I grew up with some people where I saw them consciously turn away from the Lord and some of them died. I saw this one man, I'm not gonna mention any names. I remember it was in the summer and I heard him say, cause I'd grown up with it. I'm, I'd known him all my life. I heard him say, well, you know, I tried that Jesus thing, but now I'm gonna do it this way for a while. That man was dead before the summer was out. So when you turn away from God like that and you choose to go into sin, everybody's not gonna survive. Everybody's not gonna make it, just like it was with Ruth, okay? Her and her family went away from Jerusalem and all the men died, okay? So he said, those who survived the exile, verse three, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. Sometimes you have to drag your way back to where you're supposed to be. And sometimes when you get there, it's not this instant restoration. It's not this magic kind of thing that just because you're back where you're supposed to be, everything is magically the way it's supposed to be. He said, they're in great trouble and disgrace. Then he said, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, if you don't know anything about prophetic symbols and you don't know anything about interpreting scripture, you understand that things that happen in the physical, natural world are allegories for truths in the spiritual world because there's such a thing as physical fire and then there's such a thing as spiritual fire and all spiritual fire is not the same. Just like all physical fire isn't the same, like the difference between a white flame and an orange flame and a blue flame. Those, those aren't all the same kinds of fire. There's different kinds of fire in the spiritual world too. So when it says the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, that always represents some type of invasion, some type of, of national rape, if you will. I know that's a strong word, but it means the enemy has breached your defenses. Okay? And maybe you're the one that let them in. But one thing that is consistent about God is that God puts up a wall, a hedge of protection. The physical wall of Jerusalem is representing the fact that the angel of the Lord encamps around about them that fear him because God keeps his hand around us as we stay in obedience. <laughs> but when you get into disobedience, then that wall in that head starts to come down. That's what happened on September 11, 2001. America during the 90s had moved into severe disobedience and that hedge came down, okay? And so that's what it's a sign of when the wall is broken down. It means that your self-control, now when you come on the video, please like and share. Now remember I told you, whenever a prophetic word comes forth, we want as many people as possible to, to hear it and see it because it's going to bless the people that receive it, okay? <clears throat> so it says the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. That means your self-control has been bad. Uh, it means that the enemy has moved in and pierced and invaded. And then it says, and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, if you know anything about scorched earth, if you're not familiar with that phrase, scorched earth policy or strategy means you're going to burn up everything in the area. You're going to burn it down to the ground and you're going to eradicate any trace of this existence. You're going to burn the area so badly until there will be no trace that whatever was there was there. Okay. So when it's talking about the gates being burned down with fire, that means there was an attempt to destroy, destroy the memory of the children of Israel ever being there. So you can see how terrible this exile was when they got snatched out of their land and all the things that they went through when they were in captivity. That's a whole nother. We could talk for years about what happened to the children of Israel in captivity. And there are Psalms that they wrote about when they were in captivity, like how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That's the song of captivity. Okay. So, but these things represent deeper spiritual truths that are true about us as a nation and may be true about us as individuals. So Nehemiah said, verse four, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. What's the difference between crying and weeping? Because there's a difference. Crying is when tears or moisture comes out of your eyes. And sometimes you can cry emotionally, but sometimes you can cry just because your eyes irritated. You got something caught in your eye. Maybe you've got allergies. That's crying. Weeping is different. Weeping is where you break open the, 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 the well 
of your deeper emotions because your deepest emotions live down in your gut. They live way down. They don't live on the surface. Your deepest emotions are way down in your gut, in your pit. And whenever your deepest emotions come up, they always come up with water. You don't ever talk about anything that's deep and meaningful to you and you don't start weeping. Okay? Crying, again, you get something caught in your eye and cry. Weeping is different. Weeping is when something inside of you way deep down has broken open and your deepest emotions begin to come up. So Nehemiah said he wept. Then he said, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. For some days. Why did Nehemiah do that? <clears throat> and what does that principle represent? It means that when you realize that you have messed up and there's been destruction and things are not what they should be and your walls are broken down and your gates are burned with fire and you barely survived the exile, then that means you need to take a step back, reassess your situation, uh, mourn over your situation, fast when you fast and you don't eat food or whatever it is you fast and so you can get more in tune with your spirit by not paying attention to the needs of your body and then he prayed to God. Nehemiah refocused himself. That's the point. That's what you need to do. Uh, let me give you some practical examples. If you've been through a divorce, one of the worst things you can do is jump back into a relationship right away. Lord have mercy. I could spend the whole time just on that right alone. You've seen that. If you've done it or you've seen it, you've seen somebody, they ain't bit more even five minutes broke up with the person that they were with and now they hooked up with somebody else. And six months later, they're talking about we getting married. Okay. That's not, <laughs> that's not the thing to do. You need to mourn, okay, what has gone on because you need to get it out of your system. You need to heal. Then you need to fast so you get more in touch with your spirit. Why is that so important? Because if you don't get in touch with your spirit, you only make decisions from the soulish realm, from your mind, uh, will, and emotions. And if you just make decisions from your mind, will, and emotions without asking the Holy Ghost, where am I, what should we be doing right now, then your mind and will and your emotions can deceive you. <clears throat> what you're going to do if you're in the throes of bitterness? What you're going to do if you're in the throes of unforgiveness? What are you going to do if you're deeply, deeply hurt? What are you going to do if you're confused, if you got blindsided? Let's say something happened that you didn't see coming. What are you going to do if that's your emotional state? See, you need more than your emotions at the table. That's what fasting is for. Okay? I forgot who said it. I think it was Pastor Bill Winston. Pastor Bill Winston said, fasting does not move God. Fasting moves you, <laughs> which is true. It moves you into the spirit. Then he prayed. Then Nehemiah said, now here's our focus verse, verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love, with those who love him and keep his commandments. Verse six, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. <sighs> What the Holy Ghost wants me to say is that this is a picture of America right now. And this is what we're supposed to be doing. And when I say we, I mean the nation, but judgment always starts at the house of God. Now, that, now, now you know that scripture that judgment must, must first begin at the house of God. That does not always mean that God judges us first. It does mean that, but it also means if change is going to happen, the saints have to do it. The judgments of God are going to come from God through the people of God. And so this is a picture of what we're supposed to be doing right now. We're supposed to be mourning and fasting and praying before God because of the broken down state of our nation. And maybe we need to do it individually for the broken down state of our lives. And maybe we need to do it for the broken down state of our families because Nehemiah confessed all that. Now there is another spiritual principle I want to give you if you didn't know. Let's say you're dealing with a bloodline curse. Let's, and what a bloodline curse is, I know that's a real spiritual Christian-y phrase. I like to explain our nomenclature. 
because what religious people do is they just throw out these phrases, whatever, and they never explain what they mean. And sometimes people don't understand what they mean. When you hear the, the phrase a bloodline curse, what that means is that somebody back before you lived in your bloodline sinned against God, and then it got in their blood and the blood of the descendants. So let's say your grandfather was an alcoholic. That means alcoholism got in your bloodline. So maybe your dad or your mom came out and they loved alcohol too. And then maybe you came out and you loved alcohol even more than your parents. And then maybe you have kids and your kids are getting drunk by the time they 12. That's where that comes. That's a bloodline curse. Or premature death. That's another one. If everybody in your family has got breast cancer, all the women got breast cancer by the time they was 32, and everybody in your family was dead by the time they was 50, that happened to Bishop Jakes, that happened to Patty LaBelle. Both of them, they had to break bloodline curses. Because listen to Bishop Jakes, look it up, and listen to Sister Patty LaBelle. Because both of them have talked about members of their family leaving here early, and how it was a thing that happened from generation to generation. And they was at some point in their life realizing that they didn't want to do that, but they had to break the curse. Okay? If you're dealing with a bloodline curse, you can ask God to break that curse off your bloodline. Like, let's say, for example, everybody in your family had babies out of wedlock. Everybody was just dropping kids, but they weren't building, they weren't getting married and building families. You can break that curse. You can start something new in your family where you teach your kids to get married and then have kids and build a family so they don't have kids just scattered all over everywhere. Okay? So, but the way to do it is the principle that Nehemiah shows us in these verses. He said, he mourns, he fasts, and he prays. You got to grieve over your sin. You don't wallow and stay there, but you got to realize that sin is not a joke. The wages of sin is still death. It's going to produce death. And remember, everybody's not going to survive the exile. Why do you think there's been so much death these past four years? Because the horsemen of death came into America at the beginning of 2016, and it kicked off with the death of David Bowie. You remember that? Remember how all of a sudden celebrities and old and young and all kinds of people just started dying and they died and cr started dying in crazy ways? That was actually the death horseman in America. That's why Kobe Bryant died. That was a death horseman because they talked about it in Los Angeles. They felt something coming to the city. They felt this darkness and this shroud come over the city. They didn't know what it was. It was death. That's what it was. Because the wages of sin is still death. It's not funny. It's not a joke. You got to mourn, you got to fast, and you got to pray, and you got to cry out to God. Nehemiah said, I confess the sins we Israelites, that's national. Then he says, including myself, that's personal, and my father's family. That's your first social circle is your family have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you, verse 7. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. You got to take responsibility before God. For what you have done, for what your nation has done, and what your family has done. Good God Almighty. you got to take responsibility. Why do you have to take responsibility? Because God's not going to hear you <clears throat> until you do. God is not like man. See, with man, you can do the razzle-dazzle. You can do obfuscation. You can do the curly shuffle. Boop, 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 boop. You can do all that. You can play the shell game. That's people. You can't do that with God. God is not going to hear you until, until you take responsibility for what you did, what your family did, and what you have done nationally. You can't come before the Lord with all that, that shake and bake. You can't do that. God is not going to hear you. He's not going to hear you. He's not like man. The scripture says that all things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What that means is that there's nothing hidden from God. Literally nothing. God can see the atoms and molecules in your body. God can see your bloodstream. God can see your white blood cell count. God can see the strength of the marrow in your bones. God can see the emotions in your soul. God can see all the dreams and imaginations of your spirit. There's no part of you that God can't look right at. So you can't come before the Lord with all this, you know, changing the language to try to make something seem like it's not sin. Because you don't want to call it sin, God ain't going to hear that. People will hear that. God ain't going to hear that. And people can't heal the land or else the land would have been here by now. We could do it. You got to come clean when you come before the Lord. You got to confess what your nation has done. I'm also talking to the intercessors. 
those of you that are called to an intercessory ministry before the Lord. For those of you that don't know what intercession is, it means a go-between between God and the people. God calls some people to a ministry of intercession, meaning what they do is they pray for others. They spend the vast majority of their time praying for the needs of others. They're a go-between. That's what inter intercession means. And uh, if you walk in the prophetic, you're automatically called to intercession because you're going to see some stuff that's going on. Okay, you have to learn how to intercede. So you, the principle here is you've got to confess. You've got to confess the sins of your country. You've got to confess the sins of your family. And you've got to confess your personal sins. Okay? Nehemiah said, verse 7, We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Stop. Now, I'm going to say this. I know it's rough. I had to face it. I had to deal with it. I know what I'm finna say. I know it's rough. But I'm going to say it anyway, and here it go. It's different if you grew up in church. It's different if you grew up in a godly family. Because you know, you got exposed to the Lord, and you got exposed to the Word of God, and you got exposed to the Holy Ghost as a child. Nehemiah talks about the commands, decrees, and the laws you gave your servant Moses. So he's speaking to the history of Israel. The nation of Israel was the chosen nation to receive the word of God and live the word of God. And God wanted to lift them up as a light to the Gentiles, all the non-Jews, so that all the other non-Jews would be willing to turn away from their false gods and turn to the God of heaven. That's what Ruth did. That's why she got blessed. Well, <laughs> just like the Israelites, they had a history with God. They weren't just novices. They weren't just starting out. They couldn't act like they didn't know the Lord, is my point. Okay, well, if you grew up in church, or here it is, if you grew up in a godly family, if you have a praying mama, if you had a praying grandmama, or maybe it's your dad, if you had a praying dad, you had a praying grandfather, praying papa, or somebody, my grandmother is the one that made me want to be a Christian, my father's mother is the one that made me want to be saved because I saw the Lord on her and I saw the Lord in her and I didn't even really fully know what I was looking at. I just knew when I was in her living room, I felt God's presence and it was heavy and it wasn't just her and it wasn't just sunlight coming through the window. I felt the Lord in the room before I even really knew it was him. And my grandmother is the one that exposed me to that and she took me and my cousins on, on missions trips. We would go visit the sick with her and my cousin was singing him and I would pray and she would lay hands on the sick people and I saw that before the age of 10, okay? Well, when you grow up and you are exposed to the Word of God and exposed to the Holy Ghost as a child, it's different for you. You can't act like you don't know the Lord. Good God Almighty. You can't act like you don't know the Lord. I know many of us have been in situations like Apostle Peter, where you started to curse and swear and try to act like you weren't saved because you was afraid or you want to look cool in front of your friends or whatever it was you wanted to do. You can't act like you don't know the Lord if you do. Just like they called Peter out and they're like, no, no, you hung with Jesus. Peter's like, no, I didn't. They're like, no, you sound like him. You talk like one of them, one of them Christ followers. Peter couldn't hide it. It's like you sound like a Galilean. And Peter could not hide the fact that he had spent all that time with the Lord. Here Nehemiah is saying that Israel had a history with God, that they had the law of Moses. What that means is that you know what God wants. You know what the commandments of the Lord are. You know what the Lord has said. And even on a personal level, if you've got personal prophetics, if somebody gave you a prophecy 20 years ago and you have never lived up to what that prophecy said, you still know that the Holy Ghost was talking to you. I know that's rough, but it needs to be said. We all have to deal with that. It's different if you didn't grow up in church. It's different if you weren't exposed, like you didn't know anything about Jesus till you got grown. That's different. Okay, but when you grow up in church, but again, when you grow up in a godly family, it's different for you. You can't be acting like you don't know. I know you don't like it. I know that it's easy for us as believers, especially when we're young, to want to run off because we don't want to crucify our flesh. We don't want to obey. We just want to run off and wild out. I know that's easy to do, and a lot of us do it. But no matter what you choose to do, you can't act like you don't know. 
And the day is going to come when you got to do what Nehemiah did. You got to confess. If God talked to you when you were a child, just because you ran from that for 20 years doesn't mean that the Lord changed his mind. If God called you and you five, seven, nine years old and you didn't want to hear it, you can run for 20 years if you want to. You might not survive. But if you do survive and you look up and you're 39 now and you still haven't obeyed God, the Lord didn't move and the Lord didn't change his mind. You're going to have to go back and review the commands, decrees, and, and the laws and the personal prophetic words that God gave you because you can't act like you don't know. You can't come before God with all that. Okay? So now let me get to the main focus verse. Then I said, verse 5, this is Nehemiah talking. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, see, uh, <clears throat> now, remember I told you that, uh, before I told you that word heaven, it also means sky, okay? So God of the heaven or God of the sky, the great and the awesome God, that word great in Hebrew means great, older, or insolent. You know what that means? That means God ain't changing. That word awesome in the Hebrew, it means to fear, to revere, to frighten. In other words, that means that you need to respect the Lord. You need to fear God, not the kind of fear that cripples you and puts you in a corner. That's toxic fear, not that, but the fear of awe and reverence and understanding who it is that you're dealing with. Not being flippant and casual like God is just some dude. No. Then it says that he keeps his covenant, okay? Uh, that word keeps means to hedge about, guard, protect, attend to his covenant. A covenant is a contract. So Nehemiah was saying that God made a contract with Abraham and God had blessed. Now, if you don't know why they were called Israelites, it's because uh, Abraham's grandson was born with the name of Jacob and God changed his name to Israel. That's why the Hebrews, the Jewish people, are called Israelites. That is Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who had his name changed to Israel. That's where that comes from. And he said, his covenant of loving devotion. Okay? Now, that phrase, loving devotion, mean kind, it means kindness, piety. It also means reproof, and it means beauty. What that means is that part of loving someone is rebuking them, reproving them, telling them when they're messing up. So don't be listening to these people telling you that God's unconditional love is just a bunch of warm fuzzies where the Lord won't ever put you in check. Yes, he will put you in check. He'll try to do it in a gentle and kind and quiet way. But because he loves you, he will put you in check. He said he keeps his loving devotion with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, there it is. You can't just love the Lord with lip service. Lord, have mercy. See, I could spend an hour just on any one of these phrases because that's what religion teaches you how to do. You know, we, we're not in church anymore, and some churches are trying to open back up. But in church, sometimes people make these big displays. Ain't nothing wrong with making a big display now because King David did it. But I'm saying, if all you're doing is going through these motions and dancing and singing and weeping and crying and you're just doing that, uh, the Bible says, Nehemiah says, you got to love him and keep his commandments. You got to do what the Lord says do. I say that almost every week now. You can't just serve God with this. You got to do what the Lord says do. Then Nehemiah goes into asking God to hear his prayer. Okay? So what the Holy Ghost wanted me to convey today was that this is the state of America. This might be the state of your family. And this might be the state of your personal life. You have to do what Nehemiah did. So I strongly encourage you. That's why when I prophesy, I prophesy out of scripture and I also teach so you can go back and look at it for yourself. Okay. You need to read Nehemiah chapter one, read the whole chapter like I did. Go back to this video, watch it from the beginning because the principles are in there for what you need to do. For those of you that are intercessors, this is what we need to be doing. In our prayer time, we need to be confessing the sins of America. We need, need to be confessing our personal sins. And we need to be confessing the sins of our families. So that God will have mercy. Because Nehemiah says, God will keep his covenant of love, which in includes rebuke, 
for those who love him and keep his commandments. Okay, Nehemiah goes on to, to feel the call, feel the pull to go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. His heart was broken when he saw the state of his country and his countrymen. And eventually he felt the call of God to go and rebuild that wall. Some of y'all are Nehemiah. Some of us are called to the spirit of Nehemiah. There's some things that you have seen that have been broken down that need to be rebuilt, like the family, like the house of God that looks like the Bible said it should, and not all the religious stuff that we added on. Did you notice that God tore down all the religious stuff that we built? And for these last several months, since at least the middle of March, there hasn't been easily, because some people still been getting together, and some of the people end up getting COVID-19 and dying. I'm talking about some pastors. When God puts you on a timeout, don't fight the timeout. <laughs> I'm even sorry I have to say that. When God puts you on a timeout, don't fight the timeout. He puts you on a timeout for a reason. And you need to mourn and fast and pray and seek his face and ask the Lord, what have we allowed to be torn down that's important to you? Because if you don't get that instruction, that's what the last several months have been about if you didn't know that. If you didn't understand what God was doing spiritually, because a lot of people have been dying. Some people still dying because some people are not going to make it. Get that in your head. But for those that survive, what you should have been doing for these past several months is getting your relationship with God right. And part of that includes stripping yourself of everything that you think. Going before God and telling God, I don't know nothing. And letting God talk to you. If that's what you haven't been doing since March, you have been wasting your time out. You have missed the point. Because if you think that after all this, we're supposed to go back to the way things were before the pandemic, before the pandemic hit, you have missed the point of everything. We're not supposed to go back to the way we was living. If we were living so right in the eyes of God, why is the country on fire? Why is every institution broken down? Why is there a global pandemic if what we was doing was so right? Yeah, no, I'm talking about the church, not just the nation. We're supposed to, these last couple months, to get new instructions from God, to hear what the Lord is saying now, and rebuild according to what the Lord would be pleased with. And that may not look like any type of church, anything you, you've ever had in your life. Because I'm going to say it one more time. If God was pleased with what we were doing, why is it all torn down? If God was pleased with what we were doing as a church, why is the country on fire? Where's our peace? Because God gives peace and rest to the land when he's pleased with what he sees. If God was so pleased with what we were doing, why, why is the country on fire? Now, I'm going to say this. <clears throat> this might come across as a little controversial, but oh well. <clears throat> In a very real sense, what we need is not more preachers and not more churches. What we need is people that obey God. You understand that? We have more religious outlets in America than literally anywhere else on earth. Remember, our country is not even 300 years old yet. There's nobody in America that can't hear God if you want to. We got more apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers than I think. I don't think we have the biggest mega church. I still think that's in Korea or China, one of those two. But just in terms of, of religious outlets, based on population, we have more than anybody else. So there's nobody in America that can't hear God if they don't want to. And what has happened? If what we were doing is so right, we haven't been listening and we haven't been obeying. Okay, so if you think that the point of all this was just to go right back to the way things were, you have missed the point. If more preachers and more churches was going to solve the problem, we have more than anybody. Do you follow what I'm saying? What we need is to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And because of this passage today, we need to adopt the spirit of Nehemiah and rebuild the wall. But you've got to rebuild the wall. The Lord is telling you to rebuild. Like the family, like a church that looks like what Jesus would be pleased with according to the scripture and not according to our denominationalism 
and not according to our religious traditions. Okay? Most of us, our careers are never going to be the same. Some people that were used to going to work, you might not ever go back to work like you did before. What I mean by that is in your office. You might not ever have an office job again. You might work from home for the rest of your career, or you might not ever go back to your office five days a week. You might work remotely for the rest of your career. It's not going to be like it was. That's my point. I know restaurants are trying. Restaurants are trying to get people back. Movie theaters are closing down because it's never going to be like it was. Okay? And so, so if the world misses the point, remember that they don't have the Holy Ghost. But we the saints. We ain't supposed to miss the point. And so the spirit of Nehemiah, yeah, see, I feel it coming. The spirit of, of Nehemiah is being released now from heaven where God is called. Yeah, I got to breathe that out. The spirit of Nehemiah is being released now where God is calling from heaven for his children to rebuild that which has been torn down. But we must rebuild according to the pattern that God shows us. And that will be in the scriptures. It will always be biblical. And it will be by revelation through the prophetic rhema, rhema word of God. It's not going to look like what we had. So what the Holy Ghost is trying to tell us to do is to get ready for something you haven't seen before. Some of it is going to be a return to godliness. Some of it is going to be establishment of godliness in areas that we have never seen godliness before. None of it is going to look like what was. Because me personally, me personally, me, David, I don't want to go through this again. Haven't you ever got disciplined by your parents? Then you fooled around and did again the very thing they told you not to do. If they whipped you that second time, they whipped you harder. If they punish you that second time, they punish you harder. One thing I did not personally want to do was make my father mad. Because my father would get so mad, he'd turn red. Me and my father, the same color. My father would get so mad, his skin would turn red. And I wanted to get dad that mad. I was like, yeah, you know what? It ain't worth it. I don't want to get Heavenly Father mad like that. Because if he didn't sit this whipping, and we didn't learn nothing, and we go back and repeat... The same stuff we used them for doing before, that means if he whip us again, he's going to whip us harder. Do you understand that? I hope you understand that because I don't want to have to go through this again. So I'm going to make the declaration that for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm talking about me and mine. We're going to serve the Lord. Okay? And I'm releasing that over my children and my family. That me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord because I don't want to go through this again. Okay? So the Lord is releasing the spirit of Nehemiah because it's time to rebuild. So the thing to do now is to ask the Lord, what do you want me to rebuild? And how do you want me to rebuild it? And I mean, put everything on the table, your career, your education, your finances, your marriage, your family, your children, extended family, your church, whatever, whatever you're involved in, whatever you're involved in, because as the saints, that's what we're supposed to be doing now. I really hope you took advantage of all the time God gave us to hear his voice from March until now. Because now something new is happening. Remember I tell you all the time about how you have to stay in step with the Lord? And if we do that through the prophetic, okay, the spirit of Nehemiah is being released now because it's time to rebuild now. So be sure you get your instructions for the Lord. Be sure that you have mourned, fasted, prayed, and confessed the sins. And then say, now God, how do you want me to rebuild? And watch if God doesn't restore. Because Nehemiah says, he, he keeps his covenant of love. So in other words, the Lord will bless and heal and restore and cause things to grow and prosper again if we obey. I can't stress that enough. If we obey. And we, I'm going to say this, and you're not going to like it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I have discovered that a lot of people have not been able to discern what kind of time we're in. If you disobey God now, you're going to die. What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I said that playtime is over. Playtime been over for a while. You are in a season to where if you disobey God now, you're going to die. I don't want to die before my time. I don't want to leave my kid. I don't, I don't, I don't want to leave. I want to finish my work. 
I want to be with my family. I want to do what God created me to do. I don't want to die before my time because if you disobey God now, you're going to die. You should be to a point now in your walk with God to where you are laying down your daily schedule before the Lord and saying, Lord, here's what I have on my agenda, but not my will, and but thine be done. Now, please guide me by your Holy Spirit so that if I'm not supposed to leave the house, the Holy Ghost tell me, don't leave the house right now, and then you obey. If I'm driving and the Holy Ghost say, turn right up here, don't go straight, you obey and you turn right and you don't go straight. That's where you should be in your walk with God by now. You ought to be at such a level to where when the Spirit of God begins to breathe his instructions into your spirit, you can recognize it and you obey it. But if you fool around and find yourself someplace where the Lord didn't tell you to be, doing something the Lord didn't tell you to do, during this time, you're going to die. Do you understand that? I hope you understand that. I hope enough people have dropped dead around you for you to understand this is not a game. This is not a joke. This is not playtime. Playtime, been over. But if you don't, then I did my job because <laughs> it's my job to say what the Lord told me to say. How people receive it and act on it, that's on you. Okay? I'm going to say like Bishop Jake said, all that ain't my job. It's my job to do what he told me to do. So I did my job and I released the word. That's what prophets do. Okay? So that's where you should be in your walk with God, to where every day you're surrendering your schedule. Lord, how much TV time? Lord, my diet. Lord, my exercise time. Lord, my time with my wife and my husband. Lord, my children. On and on and on and on and on. God might have given you prophetic words about your children last year because the Lord may have warned you about what was to come. Did you act on it? This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. That's where we have to be now. We have to stay in step with the Lord, the head of the church. No more of that foolishness to where we build in these churches and these church services and we're trying to be famous or we're trying to have a mega church or we're trying to get on TV or we're trying to do a whole bunch of foolish, foolishness that don't have nothing to do with what the Lord is saying. Because if you disobey God now, you're going to die. Do you understand? Well, Prophet Taylor, I think that's a negative message. I don't think you should be saying all that. Are people around you dropping dead? Yes or no? Remember, the test of a prophet is, does the word come to pass? Are people around you dropping dead? People that you know, because Facebook has turned into an obituary wall. Have you noticed that? So, that being the case, then the spirit of Nehemiah is released because God is looking for those that love him and keep his commandments to hear his voice right now because I want to rebuild the way he wants me to rebuild. And remember, I always tell you, I'm not saying anything I'm not doing. Everything I'm saying to you applies to me first. I'm doing it. And I want to rebuild the way he wants me to rebuild. I want to invest where he wants me to invest so that he's pleased with what he sees come up. Because he has proven to us that he is God and he is sovereign and we are not. And if he wants to tear our wall down, tear our little apple cart down, God can tear it down on a global scale. God can send, send something that shuts down the world. You just live through that. If you're looking at me right now, you just live through that. And you're still living through it. How can you not see that? How can you not see that this is the time to fear and reverence God and don't be acting a fool? Because outside of the protection of Christ, there's death in the air. Do you understand? You can't see it. So we're supposed to walk in the spirit of Nehemiah and rebuild according to the pattern of the Lord that you will find in the scripture and that you will get through the prophetic revelation, rhema word of God. That's why you have to seek his face and ask him and be before his throne every day. What should I be doing? What should I be doing? I personally know some folks, I'm not going to name some names, I personally know some folks that still haven't accepted their call from God. And that's why they've been going through a lot of what they've been going through. Some folks personally that I know, God called them a long time ago and they still haven't done what the Lord said to do. They're still fighting, excuse me, they're still fighting and running and doing whatever. And then they've been through a whole bunch of stuff that they didn't have to go through. <sighs> now it's not the time for that. So I'm going to believe God. We're going to obey God and we're going to rebuild. And then as we begin to do what the Lord says do, he'll forgive our sins and heal our land and bring prosperity and health and life back and lift 
the plague and so many different things will come back once we get back into obedience. Okay? All right, that's a prophetic word for today. I'm humbled by that word. I tremble at that word. I'm just a man just like you. I'm just a human just like you. Uh, I'm humbled. I tremble, but I want to obey because I want, because I understand the promise of Scripture is that both thou and thy seed may live. It's not just me. It's me and my kids. They're impacted by what I do. So it's not just me. It's me and my kids. So I want to live and I want them to live. Okay? So I'm challenged by that word, but I'm living it. I'm not, I'm not just making up what I'm saying. I'm living it. So amen and God bless. All right, I'm going to go in the spirit and ask the Holy Ghost if there's anything else he wants me to release. Hold on. Okay. All right. The Holy Ghost just gave me an image and a word. What the Holy Ghost just showed me was water rising and a dam bursting. Water rising and a dam bursting. And then he said that represents two things. He said there's going to be a dam bursting of judgment and there's going to be a dam bursting of blessing. So what that means is that what's about to happen is that those that are going to receive the judgment of God is going to break out and it's going to swallow them up. Remember how when Pharaoh chased the Israelites and wanted to get the children of Israel back into Egypt and then they got drowned in the Red Sea? All the people that suffered God's judgment, that's about to happen. God's going to break open an ocean of judgment on people and going to swallow them up. That's on the judgment side. On the blessing side, God's going to break open an ocean of prosperity. Hold on, there's more. And God said, the prosperity shall be for those who keep my word and love my name. Whew. Thus saith the Lord. I'll say it again. The prosperity shall be for those who keep my word and love my name. If you don't keep the word of God and you don't love the Lord, then God's going to break open so much judgment on you, it's going to swallow you up. It's going to be a damn bursting of judgment. If you do love the name of the Lord and you do keep his word, God's going to break open an ocean of blessing and prosperity. I want to be on the blessing side. Okay? So that means I got to obey his word and love his name. Okay? And all that are under the sound of my voice, if you're watching me live, if you're watching the replay, if you listen to the podcast, if you are watching a YouTube video, Okay, it's talking to you. It's talking to you. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. So decide which side you want to be on. I want to be on the blessing side. I don't want to be on the judgment side. Okay, so that means we have to obey and we have to love. And, and I'm going to say this a little bit and I'll be through. That's the thing about God is that he's consistent. I am the Lord. I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. The Lord doesn't change. God says the same stuff all the time. God is like, love me and keep my commandments. Love me and keep my commandments. Love me and keep my commandments. Over and over and over and over and over. God keeps saying the same thing. He's consistent. Okay? He's consistent. Okay? So he's consistent and faithful to me. So I want to learn how to be consistent and faithful with him. Because that's the way to stay on the blessing and prosperity side. Prosperity side is to keep his word and love his name. And I bless the name of Jesus right now. I declare and decree that I bless the high and holy name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the true and the living God, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, he that was dead and is alive forevermore, and he that has the keys of hell and death. Amen. He that is both God and man, who is the propitiation for our sins, who is the mediator, the intercessor, okay, where all things are unified in him. Jesus Christ, the son of the true and the living God. I bless his name. I, bl I worship him. I bless his high and holy name. I bless his name. I bless his name. I bless his name. And no devil, no demon, and no wicked person 
can stand against the name of Jesus. For God has given him a name that's above every name. Now, remember I told you in the last broadcast about how God wanted to restore seven times. That some of us have been praying for the double restoration of, of Job. But remember I showed you in Deuteronomy 28, 7, where God said, the enemy is supposed to flee from before you seven ways. And that word seven in English means all the multiples of seven. So for those of you that have chosen to be on the blessing side, get ready for a multiple of seven. If the enemy stole a thousand dollars from you, expect seven thousand dollars back. If the enemy has stolen years from you, expect the time to be multiplied to where you get as much done in the years you've lost supernaturally. If you've had a bad marriage and you want your marriage back, expect God to give you a marriage that's seven times better than what you had before. Okay? That's the kind of time, that's the kind of slot we're in. That's the kind of things the Holy Ghost are releasing, and I want that seven times blessing. All right, amen, God bless you. My third quarter prophetic devotional is available. Been having a little trouble on the website, though, but uh, I'll put the links out there because uh, uh, it's time for that third quarter prophetic devotional, so that's there, too. Remember, on the first Friday of every month, I release my new hymn on my 150 hymn projects, and then whenever I have new music, I release that on Friday at noon as well. I'm here on the second Thursday of every month. I just did my No More Genies broadcast where we get rid of our genie concept of God and we get a biblical concept of God. And I'm here every Sunday, this time, uh, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, which is my regular weekly time to re release the live prophetic word. So all those links I'll put on here. Now, also, if you want to bless my ministry, you know I don't do what I do for money. I do what I do because the Lord called me to. But many people have told me they wanted to sow into my ministry. Now, remember... When you bless a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. And what that means is that, what, see, whatever ministry you sow into, whatever anointing and mantle they have, it comes upon your life. Your prophetics will increase. Anybody's ministry that you sow into, if you find a minister that's very, very advanced in years, and they're still ministering in their 80s and 90s, sow into their ministry, okay? Because that means that long life anointing and mantle will come on you. So as you begin, like if you sow into my ministry, you get that prophetic flow. If you're a musician, you get that minister and psalmist flow. If you're a scribe, because I write, I write books, plays, music, you get that scribe flow. You start writing. All that happens when you sow into my ministry. Because whoever's ministry you sow into, whatever mantles and blessings and anointing God has put on them begins to come into your life. You get a prophet's reward, just like the Lord said. So I'll put my cash app on there. My cash app is uh, dollar sign DMT2. And it's two capitalized, not the number two, but two capitalized. Uh, PayPal and Zelle is the same, Prophet David Taylor at gmail.com. So if you wanted to sow into my ministry, that's the thing to do. Okay? All right. God bless you. Thank you so much for those of you that watch me live. God bless you to those of you that are listening to me on the podcast, on Periscope, that are watching this on Twitter, that are watching the replay on YouTube. Now, don't forget to check out my YouTube channel because I have a new format. So when you see me live here, that's one thing. It looks one way. But I have a, a totally different format that I'm using now on YouTube. So check that out. And all those links will be right here on my Facebook page and on my Twitter. Okay? If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's P-D-T-S-O-T-C. P-D-T-S-O-T-C. Stands for Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross. Okay? Amen and God bless you. Thank you so much. And I will see you same time next week, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my weekly live prophetic word. Amen. God bless. Put your